Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Welcome to Wednesday night adult Bible study. We're glad you adults are out here. Everybody an adult? <laughs> well, you think young though, right? Glory to God. I, I was reading in a book the other day, a, 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 a Christian book, you know, and I forgot the point they were making, but this was an interesting story. Uh, it has nothing to do with my message, but uh, now you have to keep in mind this book that I'm reading, it was written in 2005, okay, 2005. And so um, uh, this man uh, told the story that uh, a guy was driving down the road and he saw this limo pulled over and it had a flat tire. Now, you know, sometimes you see these limos around town. They look like they're 30 years old, you know, but this was a brand new, bright, shiny, very nice, good looking limo, you know. And so he thought, well, you know, they don't need any help or maybe it's some kind of drug deal, dealers or some, something like that. But the man pulled over and he helped the limo driver change the tire. And so when he got through, the, the back window rolled down and a man said, let me do something for you. He goes, no, 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 you, you don't have to do anything for me. Do You don't have to do anything for me. And he thought about it and he said, well, let me do something for you. He says, well, if you want to do something, it's, it's almost Valentine's Day. Send my wife a dozen roses. And so he, he wrote his name and address down and so forth and gave it to the, to the man. And he said on Valentine's Day, he said, sure enough, in a black tie box, here came a box of, of um, you know, a dozen roses, red roses. And the man said, uh, you know, he read the card and he said, said as, as promised, here's your dozen red roses for your wife. Thank you for stopping and helping us, Donald Trump. P.S. I paid your mortgage off. <laughs> <laughs> so the moral of the story is, if you see me on the side of the road and I need my tire changed, pull over and change it for me. <laughs> That's cool, isn't it? Like I said, 2005, 2005. Amen. Praise God. Well, are you ready for the Word of God tonight? We're glad you're with us. If you're on line with us, praise God. We love you. Let's begin tonight in Acts chapter 1. We'll continue our teachings on the Holy Spirit. Of course, right, at, we're talking about the Holy Spirit within us. Amen. And the Holy Spirit upon us. And at this particular time, we're talking specifically about the Holy Spirit being upon us. And in Acts chapter 1, verse number 4, it says, verse Acts 1, 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, that's Jesus, He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which He said, You have heard from Me. Verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Amen. Verse number 8, But you shall receive power, Supernatural ability and supernatural strength and supernatural might and power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then in Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 we read, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come they were all in one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled. Not just, you know, some times people say, well, just some people get filled, and, but it's not for everybody. They were all filled. Everyone we're reading the book of Acts when they got filled. They were all filled. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And so, like I said, we're, we're at a point in our series. This is actually part eight in the series. We're talking about being baptized with the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit comes upon us and endues us or, in, or encloses us with power and gives us the ability to speak in other tongues. Amen. And so uh, I, I started to move on to some other things, but I hesitated here because it, the way the Lord has led us in this, we've, we've been able to stop right here and, and talk about some things that you, can, that you can need to be reminded of and that you can use to help other people that you minister to in daily life to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And so as we've pointed out many times, if, if, if one is really, really ready to receive, now how do you know they're ready to receive? Well, that they believe this experience is true. They believe there is a sec second experience called being filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. They don't have any doubts about that. And they want to be filled. Amen. They want more of God. Amen. I, I heard about a man, this is in the early, early days of the charismatic movement. You know, there were all kind of conferences and motel rooms and great ballrooms and crowds of 3,000 and 5,000 and 10,000. Denominational people right and left were being filled with the Holy Spirit in the 60s and on into the 70s. 
and a lot of denominational preachers preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Lutherans and Baptists and Methodists and even some uh, uh, Catholic priests were well known for teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so this one man was up there preaching on it and the man in the back was just kind of mad and he stood up and said, I want you to know, I want you. The man said, well, come on up here. You got something to say? Just come on up here and tell it to all of us. That's all right, brother. And so the man came up and said, I want you to know I've got the Holy Ghost. I'm born again and I've got the Holy Ghost. I know what the Holy Ghost is and, and I don't need any more of the Holy Ghost. I've got the Holy Ghost. And so the speaker just very graciously said, said, well, listen, if you've got all of God, that's all right. If you, if you don't want any more of God, if you've got all of God you want, we're, if you're happy with that, that's fine. That's fine. And the man said, now, wait a minute. Wait, I didn't say I had all of God there was to have. I, I didn't say I didn't want more of God. And the speaker just reached out his hand and said, be filled with the Holy Ghost. And the man instantly started speaking in tongues. <laughs> but you see, this man was at least willing to admit, well, no, I, I, I'm not saying I've got all of God. Amen. But if somebody doesn't want more of God, they don't have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. But if they're ready to receive and they want to receive glory to God, then they must yield to the Holy Ghost when He comes on them. It doesn't say the Holy Ghost speaks through you. It says they were all filled and began to speak. They began to speak as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And so from a very practical standpoint, when you have strange words just, just, just seem to float up out of your spirit and it sounds like, you know, they're, they're not English, they're, they're strange words, sounds like mumbling to you, sounds strange to you, amen. Well, and your mind picks up on those words, you have to yield and you have to speak those words out. Uh, when you want to say words, you can say it this way. When, when, you, when you're praying for somebody or when somebody prays for you, of course, you're all filled with the Holy Ghost, most of you. But when you, when you want to say words other than English, then you have to tell people, cooperate with that, yield to that, boldly step out and speak those words out. So when these strange words seems to bubble up on the inside of you, and uh, just be bold to go ahead and speak those words out. Amen. See, the miracle, everybody say the miracle. The supernatural part. The supernatural part is not that you are doing the speaking, but that the Holy Spirit is giving you a language that you never learned. Amen. It's supernatural communication with God. That's the supernatural part. He's given you the perfect things to pray and say in praise to God and prayer for others and for yourself. Hallelujah. So, so it's not like you swallow a little radio. I mean, I said that in my experience because that's exactly the way I wrongly thought. But, but I read that today where Brother Hagin said that. You know, I forgot he said that. He said, it's not like you swallow a little radio and, and the Holy Spirit turns that radio on and off. And when he turns it on, words just come out of you automatically. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way for anybody that has ever spoken in tongues. No, we speak as the Spirit prompts us or urges us. Now, this will help you when you're dealing with people. Initially, sometimes people just, just stammer a little bit. Ooh, blah, 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 blah. You know, the Old Testament talks about when it's talking about tongues, talking about with stammering lips. You remember that? Well, when somebody starts to stammer, that's a good place for you to jump in and say, that's it, that's it, that's the Holy Ghost. Cooperate with that, yield to that, give voice to that. Don't speak in English. Go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. See, stick with that, stick with that. See, your boldness and your faith will encourage them. Glory to God. Because it takes not only yieldedness, it takes faith to be filled with the Holy Ghost, just like it takes faith to receive anything from God. So initially, somebody may just stammer, or they just may have a few syllables. Or sometimes people just have a, have a couple of words. Amen. So, so tell people to stick with it and expect more to come. I mean, I, I talked about my experience, how I, I, once I realized this, I immediately began to speak in tongues, but I didn't have a very large my prayer language didn't have a lot of vocabulary to it. It was just three or four phrases. But as I stuck with it and stuck with it, you know, and, and, and just in a matter of a couple of days, it just began to flow out of me like a river. Hallelujah. So you have to encourage people along those lines. And I've also learned that, that sometimes people in a public atmosphere, sometimes people are very shy. Sometimes they're self-conscious. And sometimes they're distracted by everything going around them, you know. Amen. And so you tell them to go home. You spoke in tongues. You can speak anytime you want to. It's your prayer language. Get along where you're not distracted. Take those few syllables. Take that, those mumblings and just give voice to it. Step out in faith with boldness and just, just pray on your own. Amen. Glory to God. I remember one gentleman, young man, you remember him, prayed for. And when I prayed for him, he spoke in a beautiful, fluent language, actually. 
But then he'd get home. He'd, he'd call me because this happened three or four times. It might be 10 o'clock at night. It might be later. And he'd say, I can't do it. And I said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And I'd go over things with him again and pray with him again. And he'd start, he'd start speaking. But then in just a couple of weeks, he was like, no, no, no. You know, you know, if somebody, you got to remember, some of you have been speaking in tongues for 30 years, 40 years, maybe longer. But when people that, that haven't had this experience yet, the devil will fight them every step of the way. Even after they've been born, even after they've spoken in tongues, he'll tell them that's not really doing any good. That doesn't amount to anything. What is that? You don't even know what you're saying. So he'll fight. Now see, if you've been speaking in tongues for a lot of years, you ain't, you've never had any of those thoughts in years and years and years. But new people that come along, you, you have to encourage them sometimes because the devil's trying to, to fight them. He does not want them to have this supernatural Pentecostal experience. Can you say amen? amen. Glory to God. So a lack of yieldedness is one of the two main reasons. Everybody say two. Two main reasons people don't speak in tongues uh, when they want to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The other reason that people don't speak in tongues, and this is important because this does happen, is a lack of faith. Sometimes in ministering to people and talking to people, you're praying for them and, and, and you're talking about the Spirit of God prompting them. You're talking about words floating up into their mind. You're talking about the, they have the urge or the prompting or the need to speak strange words. And they're going... I don't feel nothing. I don't see nothing. I don't have any urges. I don't have any problems. I don't have any leadings. I'm, you know, it's like, you know, you lay hands on them. It's like laying hands on, hands on a doorknob. Well, in those cases, it's a lack of faith. Amen. Well, how does faith come? By hearing. It doesn't come any other way. Amen. Faith, faith grows and is developed as you act on it and put it to work against the pressures of life. But it comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you've got to get people, you know, what people have to do is they need to read these scriptures in Acts. You know, Acts 1, 8. And they need to go back and read where Jesus said, you know, uh, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you'll be endued with power from on high. They need to take, you know, there's five instances of people being filled with the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts. Tell them, read those scriptures for yourself. Read them studiously. Read them carefully. Read them prayerfully. Why? Because faith comes. Faith comes. Can you say amen? amen. Glory to God. So, so people have to, have to do that. And then sometimes people, have, they, they believe it's real, but they don't know how to release their faith. And so listen to what I'm about to tell you. I don't care if you raised somebody from the dead two weeks ago. You have to be careful that you don't slip back into the natural because the way you, you, faith to be filled with the Holy Spirit is the same for faith to be healed. It's the same for faith to receive an answer to prayer, a faith to be delivered. It, faith works the same way in all areas. And so sometimes people that want to be filled with the Holy Spirit don't have much teaching on faith, but this will help you. No matter where you are, this will be a good reminder you have to teach people, don't substitute hope for faith. People come, they know it's real, they want it's real, and they're just hoping God will do something for them. No, 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 that's not what faith does. You know that, amen? Amen, listen. Hope says, I sure hope he answers my prayer. I hope he does. Are you going to get what you came up here for? I sure hope so. Are you going to be filled with the Holy Ghost when I lay hands on you? I sure hope so. You have to understand when I came along, I prayed for people that had been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit for one year, two years, five years, and maybe up to 15 and 20 years because they had never been instructed. I'm going to tell you, read you a story in a minute about a man that was at Azusa Street for most of their meetings as a young child and 50 years later was still not filled with the Holy Ghost until somebody came along and taught him about faith. Ah, and so, so you have to understand, faith says, when I pray, I know the Holy Spirit will come on me. That's what I tell people. When, when we pray, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. He will give you utterance, uh, give you, you know, the ability to speak in tongues. So you should expect to speak in other tongues. But you know, when people come, they've, they've got to believe this is real and they've got to know how to receive by faith. Now, now so many stories, but this will help us and, and keep me, you know, online here, but here's something, for, a couple of things from Brother Hagin. He said, you know, it's so important that you understand this because faith, in, or faith is the same in any, other, any area, whether it's finances or the baptism of the Holy Ghost or divine healing or whatever. He said, I remember I was conducting a tent meeting in Waco, Texas. The very first man in the line came to receive the Holy Ghost. I said to him, will you be filled with the Holy Ghost as I lay my hands on you and pray? 
Well, he said, Brother Hagin, I sure hope I will. I hope so. I said, well, you won't be. And this sort of made him angry. I meant that to help him, not to anger him. So I immediately said to him, you don't receive from God through hope. It's by faith that you receive. And, and people may not express this today because they've been taught better, but I promise you people think this way. He's, he said, well, well, I don't know whether I'm going to receive or not. And I'm just not going to say I am. You know, I'm going to ask, and if something happens, then, then, then it, you know, but that's not the way. How many of you know that's not what faith does? He said, I'm not going to say, that, 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 you know, he said, he said, you don't know from, ah. He said, well, I don't know whether I'm going to receive or not, so I'm not just going to say I am. Well, I said, if I offered you a dollar bill, would you say, well, I don't know whether I can receive that or not? No, certainly not, he said. Well, I said, God offers you. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. God offers you a gift that's just as easy to receive as it would be if I offered you a dollar bill. Well, yeah, but he said, now I've been seeking a mighty long time, in fact, about 13 years, and I haven't received yet, so I don't know whether I am or not. He became quite upset about it. So I just reached out and put my arms around him and hugged his neck, and I said, now, brother, I'm here to help you, but under the conditions, I could lay my hands on your head until I wore every hair off the top of your head and you wouldn't get anything. So I suggest that you go sit down there, sit on the front row, listen and watch and see what's going on. And you'll see the difference between doubting and believing between faith and hope. And so he prayed for other people that just instantly received. And he, and he said to the man, you know, spoke to him on the front row and says, now do you see the difference between just hoping you'll receive the Holy Ghost and really believing? Yea, he said, I guess I do. Well, he stayed there for, for more nights. On Friday night, he was back again, and he was the very first man again in the line. Well, I said to him, I see you're back. Yes, he said, I'm back, and I'll tell you something else. I've changed my hope into faith. He said, just put your hands on me, and I'll be filled with the Holy Ghost right now. I reached out to lay, uh, to lay upon that fellow, and I had hardly laid hands upon him until both of his hands went up, and he was speaking with other tongues almost instantly. Oh, it makes such a difference when you really believe God and just don't hope that you'll receive the Holy Ghost or healing or an answer to prayer or help for financial needs or whatever it is. Actually, this man said he'd been seeking for 13 years, but really he had just been hoping that he would get the Holy Ghost. You don't receive by hoping, you get by faith. Amen? And so here's the story I alluded to a while ago. This is amazing to me. He says, I was holding a meeting in California. Well, Azusa Street, you know, was in California. 1950. There was a man there, 80, by the way, this is in his Bible faith study course. This is not in his course on the gifts of the Spirit or the baptism in the Holy Spirit or tongues. He's talking about faith here. Because you see, it does take faith to be filled with the Holy Ghost, just like it takes faith to receive anything from God. You follow me? So he's in California. And he said, here's this man, 83 years old, who came along with others to receive the Holy Spirit. I learned that he had been seeking to be filled with the Holy Ghost for 50 years. In fact, he said to me, Brother Hagen, my wife received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the revival years ago in, here in Los Angeles at the old Azusa Street Revival. Azusa Street Mission, rather. He went on to say, some people have said that everyone who went there got the Holy Ghost, but I went through that whole meeting for three years, three services a day, and I was in every one of them. I sought the Holy Ghost every time, and I didn't get him. Now, Azusa Street, in case you don't know, happened in 19, what, oh... 406, you know, it's one of the, it's, it's the modern day beginning of the modern day Pentecostal movement and then later the, the, the charismatic movement and everything that we've experienced over the last 120 years or so. It was, it was the fire of God came down, the glory of God came down on a regular basis. There were, there, were, there were people from all over the world came to this little mission out in the middle of nowhere. Well, I don't know if it was in the middle of nowhere, but it was just a small, you know, insignificant building. Uh, the, the fire of God looked like it was on that building. You know, sometimes the fire department came because they thought the building was on fire. The I've read stories, firsthand accounts of people that were just children. And they said, they said the glory cloud came down, you know, the Shekinah glory of God. And, the, you know, it just came like the cloud filled the house time and time again. They said, we just played in it as kids. People, people, of course, were saved. People were healed. There was mighty miracles. And, of course, the great thing, the, the big thing about, the, uh, about Azusa Street was a revival of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues. And so here's this man that said, yeah, I went for three years, three times a day, wanted to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and didn't get filled with the Holy Ghost. 
So just because you're around the move of the Spirit and even miracles and, and even the Shekinah glory shows up in this service doesn't mean you're going to get filled with the Holy Ghost sometimes because he had to learn. You know, for somebody to come along, no glory cloud, no, no anything, somebody had to teach him how to operate in faith. Are you listening? I knew, Brother Hagin says, the second time I laid hands on me in my spirit by revelation, of course that's supernatural, Word of knowledge, just exactly what his trouble was. But I also saw that I couldn't get him to accept it. Just because you know what somebody needs doesn't mean that they know what it is. You have to seek God on how to get that truth across to him. He wouldn't believe it. Sometimes you can tell what's wrong with, well, he says, sometimes you can tell what's wrong with folk just because you know. It doesn't always work for them. They've got to know it also. I'd had a revelation, but I couldn't get him to see it. But he came night and day, and I began to teach. Of course, he's teaching on faith. Finally, it dawned on him. It's a strange thing to me that he had heard it for about a week and didn't get it. He had to hear it over and over again. That's the reason I, kept teaching, I keep teaching certain truths over and over again. Folks don't get it just because you say it once. After about 10 days, he came to me at the close of one of the morning meetings. I'd already taught it the first week, and I was going over the same teaching again the second week. He said, Brother Hagin, you know, I just caught it this morning. I see now why I haven't received. I never have believed. I've been hoping for 50 years that I'd be filled with the Holy Ghost. I said, I knew it, brother. I knew it the second time I laid hands on you and prayed. It was revealed to me. I also knew I couldn't get you to see it. I also knew if you'd keep coming, you'd see it eventually. Now he said, you're going to have to give me a little more time. I said, that's all right, brother. Take all the time you want. He said, you know, I've been down this road for 50 years. And it's going to take me a little while to get stopped, turned around, and headed back the right direction. I said, that's all right, brother. Just take all the time you want. But keep on coming to the services. Oh, he said, we'll be here every service, day and night. I said, all right, keep coming. And when you get that hope changed into faith, I'll know it, you'll know it, and you'll receive. About three days later on a Friday night after we had dismissed, this man came to the pastor and me, to me and said, Brother Hagin, I wonder if I could get you brethren to lay hands on me. I've changed my hope into faith. I'm ready. I'm ready. I said, are you expecting to receive? Yes, he said. Just put your hands on me and I will receive right now. That pastor and I laid our hands on him and almost immediately his hands were in the air, his mouth was open, and he was talking in tongues. But you see, he had been hoping for 50 years that he'd get the Holy Ghost. Friends, hope is a good waiter, but a poor receiver. Too many times when it comes to prayer, folks say, well, I'm a hoping and a praying. I'm praying and hoping. Did you ever hear that? Did you say that? Well, correct yourself. Next time say, slap your, stop yourself, slap your, your jaws and say, stop that because that's not faith. You hear folks say, well, all we can do is just hope and pray. If that's all you're doing, you're defeated. No, you got to get over in faith. See, if you're really in faith, you know what God is going to do before you ever pray. You're confident. That's what faith is. It's a confidence and it's assurance. See, Abraham was fully persuaded, fully confident. See, you're assured, you're confident. You believe, you receive, you're fully confident, you're fully persuaded that you will receive when you pray. And if you're not fully confident, then go back and hear the word of God on healing or the baptism of the Holy Spirit or deliverance or finances until you're at that point where you say, I know that I know that I know that it's absolutely the perfect will of God to do this for me. And when I pray, I will receive. Amen. Praise God. So, so you know, uh, actually, I think, I think that in praying with people, it's been easier to get them to yield to the Holy Ghost than it was to get somebody that just stood there and just didn't have any faith whatsoever. You know, just, just, just like I said, like laying your hands on a doorknob. You know, no, you, you, you use your faith. Use your faith. Can you say amen? amen? Praise God. Now, while we're at it, while we're at it here, let me mention a couple of other things that hinder people from receiving the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sometimes people don't get filled with the Holy Ghost because they don't think they're good enough or holy enough to receive. Well, you know, thank God we've had almost 50 years of good teachings on righteousness and grace, so we don't have as much of a problem about that as we used to. But people just think, I'm, I'm not good enough. You know, I, I know when I was seeking to be filled with the Holy Ghost, I thought wrongly. I thought, well, that's just reserved for people that are just super, super close to God and super, super holy. You know, well, no, let me ask you something. If you've been born again, you're, 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 you're right with God and you're ready to receive. 
And so I could tell you a lot of stories along those lines, but my favorite story, I think, involves John Osteen. And uh, again, this is Brother Hagin telling the story. This is his book, Tongues Beyond the Upper Room. He said, years ago, I was holding a meeting at Sister Goodwin's church, Brother and Sister Goodwin's church, who were also friends and fellow ministers. After one of the morning services, a denominational woman came over to Brother Goodwin and, and me and said, I want you to pray for me. I've come to understand that I need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Brother Goodwin replied, well, there's never a better time than now. She said, oh, no, oh, no, I just want you all to pray for me. I couldn't receive right now. I've got some more digging to do. She meant that she had to, more praying and preparing to do before she could be ready to receive. Brother John Osteen, who was also standing there with us and president of the meeting, and who came from the same denominational background as this woman, and he knew where she was missing it. Or he, just, he knew where she was missing it. And so Brother, Hagen, Brother Osteen said, John Osteen, you know, Joel Osteen's father, said, well now, sister, aren't you saved? She goes, oh yes. Are you blood washed, born again, child of God? She said, oh yes. Do you believe that if you were to die this minute, you'd go to heaven? Why, yes, she said, I, I know I would. Brother Osteen said, well then, sister, if you're good enough to go to heaven, you're good enough to have a little more heaven in you. It's a good way to put it, isn't it? If you're good enough to go to heaven, then you're good enough to have a little more heaven in you. You don't have to do any more praying. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses you from all sin. It's the blood that made you worthy to receive the Holy Ghost. And, and that, that's, a, that's another hindrance to faith, see, whether it's being baptized in the Holy Spirit or, 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 or getting healing. People just think, well, uh, you know, the devil will tell them you're, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. But if you've been cleansed in the blood, praise God, hallelujah, then you're worthy to receive. If the, it's the blood that made you worthy to receive the Holy Ghost. It isn't anything you did. It's the blood of Jesus that made you a new creature. Well, this woman saw, the, saw what Brother Osteen was saying to her. Then Brother Osteen, Brother Goodwin, I prayed for that dear lady, and she almost instantly received the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. Too often Christians make the same mistake this woman made, thinking there is something they have to do to, to earn or to be worthy enough to receive what God has already promised to give them. Or they get on the negative side of being filled with tongues and talk themselves out of what they already have. This is what you've got to get established in your heart. When a child of God asks in faith to be filled with the Holy Ghost, our Heavenly Father is not going to re refuse His request. And when someone receives the Holy Ghost, he will receive the Bible evidence of that gift. All he has to do is yield to the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in faith, not allowing himself to speak in his own native language. As he does, he will speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives him utterance. So open your mouth, drink deeply of the Spirit, keep drinking till you're full, then speak out that utterance he gives you. Don't let the devil or anyone else, including yourself, talk you out of what God has already given you. This is a whole new dimension in God to explore. There is, rather, a whole new dimension in God to explore after you receive the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? And then, and then one last thing along these lines of, of, of what hinders people you have to stay out of fear, amen, when you're prayed for to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, this is part of my testimony. You have to boldly by faith believe God will give you what you ask for. God's not going to give you some kind of substitute or some kind of false spirit or some kind of wrong spirit. Or even worse than that, God's not going to give you some kind of demonic spirit. I don't know what it is. People love to tell stories about people. They, they were speaking in tongues. That wasn't tongues at all. That was some de devil or demon. Well, that might happen every hundred years from one out of a hundred million people. But everybody I've ever prayed for, I never heard anybody speaking in a demonic tongue. They've all been speaking in tongues as the Holy Ghost gave them the utterance. And let's look at Luke chapter 11 here because this is so important. Luke chapter 11. Understand this, Luke 11. They'll put it on, on the screen for you in a minute, guys. We'll put up Luke 11, 11. If you're a child of God and you're asking God, who is God? He is your heavenly father. You're, you're his child. He's your father. You're asking him to fill you with the spirit as he made available to you, as he promised to give you as a believer as he wills to give you, it's his desire. So you're asking God, your father, to give you something that he wants to give you. Well, you're not going to get something else. Amen. You, you, you. See, some people are afraid that they're going to get the wrong thing. Or With me, I don't think I was afraid of getting the wrong spirit. I was just afraid it wasn't going to be real. I want it to be real. I want it to be real, you know. Well, there's where faith comes in. You've got, you got to exercise some faith here. But so, so Brother Hagin said, 
In more than 65 years of being among full gospel people, 65 years, I never once saw once someone receive a wrong spirit when they were asked, when they prayed for it or asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not one single time. So in Luke chapter 11, verse number 11, it says, Luke 11, 11, if, any, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? Just like you as a parent, if your child asks you for food, you, you, you wouldn't give them a stone. You, you wouldn't give them a snake, a serpent. And keep in mind, actually, that when he says, will he give him, a, he talks about scorpions and he talks about serpents. Scorpions and serpents here are talking about the power of the enemy and demonic spirits. You can see that right here in Luke chapter 10, verse number 19. It says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. When he's talking about serpents and scorpions, he's talking about the power of the devil and demonic spirits. And he says, when you ask for the, the Father to give you the Holy Ghost, just like you wouldn't give your, your, a, a demon or a serpent to your son who asked you for food, the, the Father's not going to give you a false spirit, a wrong spirit, an evil spirit. No, how much more will your Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask Him? So people, you have to tell them sometimes, get out of fear. Get out of fear. Faith can't operate while you're operating in fear. Get out of fear. Get out of thinking that you're going to get some wrong demonic spirit when you ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit and expect to be filled with the Holy Spirit and expect to speak in other tongues when He comes on you. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, that was just an add-on to my sermon and it took up most of our time. Acts chapter 2, verse number 4. Glory to God. Let's also pick up here in Acts chapter 2. Verse number 38, Acts 2, 38. Well, let's read verse 37. Peter preached to them, you know. It says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You'll be born again. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. Praise God. So as we said, there are five examples or five uh, instances of believers being filled with the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. We've looked at, at four of those in some detail. And as, as you look at those, you can glean a lot of different truths about this subject. But we never have specifically looked at the, at the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. So let's look at that before we move on. Like I said, we've looked at all these others, but we haven't looked at this one specifically. So let, let's get that one in, Acts chapter 10. In the first part of Acts chapter 10, uh, Peter is supernaturally dealt with by God to go to Cornelius' house and to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. You got to remember this is the early church. They're all Jewish believers and they don't have the revelation that the gospel is not just for the Jews, it's for everybody. And the Jews, you know, they didn't have any dealings with the Gentiles. And, and so Peter has that experience where, where God lets down that sheet and there's all kind of things that Jews aren't allowed to eat in it. And God says, rise, kill and eat. And Peter says, I, I, I've never let anything unclean, you know, unclean according to the Jewish law. I've never eaten anything that's unclean. And God said to him, uh, what God has cleansed, don't you call unclean. And that happened three times. And then, all, then the Spirit of God said, there are three men here, you know, coming to you. He said, go with them, doubting nothing. And so he went with them and they led him to Cornelius' house, who is a Roman, and to Gentiles. And so we, we pick up the story here in Acts chapter 10 and verse number 24. Acts 10, verse number 24. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends and Peter was coming in. Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. As he talked with him, he went in and found many who, come together, who had come together. Then he said to them, You know that it is how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with one, to, excuse me, with, with or go to another nation, one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Verse 29. Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent. 
for I asked, I asked then, for what reason have you sent me? So Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and in the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a, stand, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms, your giving, are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and to, to Simon, to Joppa, and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and now you have done well to come. Now therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. The word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree, by crucifying. Him God raised up from the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Now if you analyze Peter's sermon to them, they've got everything they know to be saved, don't they? He's preached Jesus unto them. He said he died on the cross. He's been raised from the dead. And when you believe on him, you'll receive the remission of sins. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Or you could say came upon them. You should receive power. The Holy Ghost fell upon them and all those who heard. And those of the circumcision, the Jews, who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For, how did they know? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter said, Can anyone forbid water that, they should not, that, that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few more days. So once again, we see in this case, they were, they, were, they were born again and filled with the Spirit, you know, in essence, simultaneously, and they begin to speak in other tongues. Glory to God. Amen? Glory to God. Now, now, when it comes to, and they knew they were filled with the Spirit because they heard them speak with tongues. Now, when it comes to speaking in tongues, people have all kind of, kind of crazy ideas about speaking in tongues that are, that are unbiblical. But a couple of the most prevalent objections are, number one, tongues have ceased. And number two, not everyone is to speak in tongues. So let's look at those real quickly before we close tonight. Number one, have tongues ceased? Somebody says, well, the Bible says that, doesn't it? And then with four Bibles and six concordances, they can't tell you where that scripture is. But I can tell you where it's at. It's the scripture they're misinterpreting is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So let's go over there and look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Y'all for y'all are really quiet out there. Y'all is everybody breathing? <laughs> Glory to God. These lights are really, really bright sometimes. <laughs> First Corinthians 13, love never fails, or really it says love never comes to an end. Love never runs out, it never fails. It's, it, it's never going to quit. It's never going to come to an end. But whether they are prophecies, they will fail. Whether they are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish in part. Amen. Well, in the first place, it says tongues shall cease. It doesn't say tongues have ceased. It says there will come a time when tongues will cease. Tongues, are, are, tongues and interpretation of tongues are particular to our dispensation. They're particular, they belong to the age of grace or to the church age. All the other gifts of the Spirit are found throughout the Bible in the Old Testament. But tongues and interpretation tongues are only found in the New Testament church. Glory to God. And so one day these things shall tease, cease. Tongues haven't ceased today because it goes on to read. Let's read this. For we know in part, it says whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Has knowledge vanished away? No. no. See, see, it doesn't say tongues have ceased, but the tongues and knowledge in the future shall cease and vanish away. But tongues haven't ceased anymore. Uh, the knowledge has passed away. 
And you can see that in context, for in verse number 9 it says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. Amen. Uh, verse 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Well, do we see Jesus face to face yet? Then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. That day is coming, but it hasn't come yet. Some people have tried to use verse 10 and say, we no longer need tongues because when Paul says, when that which is perfect has come, and they say that which is perfect is the Bible in its completed form. So since the Bible has come in its completed form, we don't need tongues anymore. But even among our denominational brethren, uh, in their commentaries and among their theologians, most of them reject the idea that the Bible in its completed form is what's being referred to here. The reason they reject it is because it's not what's being for, referred to here. And you don't have to be a theologian to know that. All you have to do is be able to read. Amen. So, so, so when you read this in context, we see that even though the Bible has come, and it, we've had the Bible, I've got almost 200 of them in my office, you know, we still just know in part, don't we? We still don't see him. That day has not come yet. Glory to God. So tongues haven't ceased. Knowledge hasn't ceased. Glory to God. And we still see uh, in a mirror dimly or sometimes. We still see everything. We don't see everything clearly like we will when Jesus returns. Oh, glory to God. Say, thank God he is coming back. Obviously, knowledge not passed away or vanished. We still know in part and tongues have not ceased. Only in heaven will we know as we are known right now. Plus, Paul, j just in the next chapter, but in other places, encourages believers to speak with tongues and forbids, you know, tells us to forbid not to speak with tongues and gives us several reasons as to why we should speak with tongues. And then the second main objection is also found right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, verse number 30, it says, do all have gifts of healings? Well, if you back up, it says, are all apostles? What's the answer to that question? Are all prophets? What's the answer to that question? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? No, the answer is no. Amen. So uh, here's what you have to understand. Uh in the book of Acts, everyone who was prayed for to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit and who was filled with other tongues or was filled with the Spirit spoke in other tongues. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. They shall speak with new tongues. So all can and should speak in tongues when it comes to the baptism in the Holy Spirit in their own private devotions. But this says, not all speak in tongues. So what's the deal? Here's the deal. Every believer who has been filled with the Spirit can and should speak in tongues in his own private devotions. Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 30 is talking about ministering tongues in a public assembly. Do all speak in tongues in the public assembly? No. Do all interpret? No. So if you back up, you know, well, let me say a couple other things first. <laughs> not everyone does that. So yes, all who are baptized in the Holy Spirit, amen, should speak in other tongues. But no, not everyone is used to publicly give a tongue or to interpret a tongue. And actually, it's a little deeper than that. We got some people looking for deep. It's a little deeper than that. Look at verse 28. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles. What is an apostle? A ministry gift. Second prophets. What is a prophet? A ministry gift. Third, teachers. What is a teacher? You remember Ephesians says God has said in the, he ascended on high and he gave gifts unto men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Teachers, a ministry gift. After that, miracles and gifts of healing. Very interesting. An evangelist, any one of you or me, any one of us might operate in miracles or gifts of healing. But you see, an evangelist, that operates in his ministry on a regular, continual basis. It's not just every once in a while. And so right here, you know, he's talking, Paul's talking about apostles. He's talking about teachers. He's talking about prophets. And then when it comes to the evangelist office, he just identifies him by the gifts in which he's used on a regular basis. Instead of saying evangelist, that's talking about the evangelist office. And so these, these are ministry gifts. And so he says, they're all prophets. Not everybody's, not everybody's a prophet. Not everybody. And do all have gifts? Do all speak with tongues? He's not talking about, 
In reality, anybody that's filled with the Holy Ghost could potentially be used to stand up and give a tongue. Anybody that's filled with the Holy Ghost could potentially interpret a tongue that's given in the public assembly. So that's really not what he's talking about. He's saying not everybody has a ministry gift of tongues or interpretation of tongues. You're going to see that more regularly in somebody that's like a prophet who's regularly used on a consistent, regular basis. And he has the, our pastors in, often operate in that gift. But any, any, so, he, so he's talking about a ministry, not just public use of tongues, but the ministry gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. And the answer to that question is no, not everybody's used that way. Not everybody has that ministry gift. Do you see that? Praise God. So when it comes to, to the baptism in the Holy Spirit in tongues versus diversities of tongues, you know, uh, in the public assembly, two different things. Same in essence, but they have a different purpose. It's, it's like roads. You can't just, I mean, if you're thinking super highway, and I'm talking about some country, ho, high, you know, country road, and, and you're thinking super highway, and I'm talking about that country road, that's not going to make any sense to you. Because I'm talking about the ditches and you got to be real careful and you got to watch for the mud. You can't go but 20 miles an hour and you're going, what are you talking about? I'm going to drive 70 miles an hour on the interstate. You know, roads, but different kinds of roads. And so one is for one purpose, one is for the other. Do you see that? Amen, amen. So when he says, do all speak with tongues? He's saying, do all have a public ministry gift of regularly speaking in tongues and interpretation? And the answer is no, praise God. But everybody... Everybody, when they're filled with the Holy Ghost, should have tongues as a devotional gift. It, 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 sh it should be as, um, oh, what's his name? Howard Carter said, a never-ending flow, a never-ending stream that should never run dry. Glory to God. And we'll just close with this because I, I don't have time, but we'll just close with this. I, I'm going to paraphrase some things, something here, but it's accurate. It's an accurate paraphrase. This is what Smith Wigglesworth said. This is what Kenneth Hagin said. This is what many other Pentecostal leaders said. You can't edify others unless you're first built up and edified yourself. You can't help others unless you can help yourself. But when you're edified because you spent time in praying in tongues, then you can go out and edify others and help them. Smith Wigglesworth said, I just get edified myself. I build myself up by praying in the Holy Ghost. Then I go out and edify others. Praise God. Amen. So as when you make a regular practice of praying in tongues, you appropriate or release the supernatural power and help of God. You can help people in the natural, but we're talking about supernaturally helping them. And supernatural power, giving you the ability you don't have to do. Even the power to do things you don't have the power to do. You have that supernatural help and supernatural power and supernatural ability to go out and help people that's available to you as a spirit-baptized believer. But the more you pray in tongues, the more manifestations and the more supernatural ability and power you'll see in your everyday life. Can you say amen? Amen. I mean, let's stand together. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. How many were like me and struggled to pray in tongues when you were seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Lift, lift your hand high. That's about 40% of the crowd. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. But when the light came, glory to God, it was made simple, wasn't it? Hallelujah. The entrance of His Word gives light. Thank God for the Word. Everybody say, thank God for the Word. Thank God for the Word. 50 years. Man went to Azusa Street every time the doors were open and didn't get filled until somebody came along and taught him the truth. Because you see, we love that scripture. It's the anointing that removes burdens and destroys yokes, but the word is anointed. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Can you say amen? amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you.